market action. The sentiment was downbeat across the world as investors brace for more rate hikes from the US Federal Reserve later this week. But stocks in India managed to buck the trend. Sensex gained 300 points and the Nifty gained nearly 100 points. Anut Singhal is here with the market trap. Well, the theme for Indian market has been outperformance and that continued today, though in the first 15 minutes it looked like uh, the market was collapsing, but then there was big comeback. There were a lot of stocks which did well. Autos did well. Some of the banks, X of ICICI, consumption did well. The go-to sector once again, though, was cement. Uh, what a rally it's been for that space. Uh, the broader market, though, was down for second day running in terms of advanced decline. Uh, on the index, we had Mahindra, Bajaj Finance, SBI Life. And then some of the heavies like Hindustan Unilever, HDFC and ITC, which did quite well. On the losing side, ICICI Bank, which has been otherwise a strong stock, was down today. Tata Steel and Tata Motors. Uh, in the FNO space, uh, the top two gainers were cement stocks, India Cement and Ambuja. Uh, big moves in, uh, in both these names. Uh, Escorts was the other one, which did well. And on the losing side, we had Campion Homes as a top loser, followed by Delta Corp and GNFC. All right. Thanks, Anuj, for joining us. Some bullish opinion on the market. Ramdeo Agarwal, chairman and co-founder of Motilal Ospal Financial Services, says that the Indian market will constitute 5% of the global market capitalization over the next decade. He also remains optimistic that foreign institutional investors will soon realize that India's story is unique and India will get its fair allocation. See, today India is about 3.5% of the world in terms of market cap. We are about... Uh, uh, of the about 100 trillion dollar global market cap, we are about three and a half percent. And uh, in next three, four, five years, we are very. I mean, the way the world is today, I think uh, India's gain in uh, market cap share is going to be quite rapid. So we are heading towards in next uh, decade at least uh, to about five percent of the global market cap. I remain positive, op optimistic that maybe with a little gap, uh, FIs will definitely stop selling, but uh, they might. Uh, as the uh, earnings momentum is maintained, uh, I think they would they would come to uh, buy here and build the portion uh, of their portfolio. Cryptocurrencies have seen a big fall over the last few days. Bitcoin is below nineteen thousand dollars, and the overall market cap of all currencies is below one trillion. Manisha Gupta is here with the key effect factors affecting this development. Well, yes, it has been a sharp decline in cryptocurrency markets. Every crypto is down by anywhere between 10 to 25 percent on the weaker side. And this is ahead of the U.S. Fed meeting on 21st with expectation that we are looking at a 75 to even 100 basis points of an interest rate hike. We have seen other asset classes take cognizance of that as well, but cryptos really seem to be taking it to the chin. So when you look at the overall global crypto market capitalization, that has declined yet again to below $1 trillion to just about $909 billion as of now. But the interesting trend is that you have seen an increase in the trading volumes here that has gone up by nearly 45 percent to 69 billion dollars for the overall crypto market within this as well when you look at bitcoin that one is trading at the lowest since 2020 we have seen it hit 17,600 on the lower side bitcoin actually has been on a declining spree since it hit an all-time high of 69,000 dollars in november 2021 not just Bitcoin, Ethereum is down by 10% as we talk right now and that has hit a July low of $1,300 as well. For Ethereum as well, since the... Uh, uh, since the merger went through, the prices have been constantly declining. It's just bad timing here and the market has not been able to go on an uptick here. But these are not the only cryptocurrencies. When you look at Solana, Cardano, XRP, all of these cryptocurrencies are down anywhere between 10 to 15 percent as well. And when you talk about this year, we are down by anywhere between 55 to 85 percent down for many of those cryptocurrencies. An year which clearly is going on to the negative side. Even as we have done eight months of the year, there has been not one single month that you have gains in any of these cryptocurrencies. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Manisha, for explaining the crypto crash. Let's uh, focus on uh, the fresh round of layoffs at ride-hailing app Ola. The company is likely to hand out pink slips to at least 500 employees across different software verticals of ANI Technologies and Ola Electric. Many of these employees are believed to have been working on different aspects of the Ola app. The move comes in the backdrop of declining sales of the Ola Electric scooter. Uh, when we reached out to uh, Ola Electric and ANI Technologies, uh, the company denied reports of uh, 500 people being laid off. Uh, they said that 
the restructuring is likely to impact about 200 employees or 10% of its 2,000 strong engineering workforce. They also said that they would like to increase the number of uh, uh, engineers to 5,000 in the next 18 months or so. And uh, this is across non-software roles. But uh, we are given to understand from our sources that the number of people in software roles who are likely to get pink slips over the next few days uh, could be at least 500. Now, this is coming in the backdrop of declining sales. Uh, from 12,700 in April, the sales uh, in the month of August came down to about uh, 3,351. Uh, so the company has been looking at ways to boost sales, one of which was to launch uh, a lower-priced mass-market S Ola, uh, Ola scooter, also to take feedback from the public whether they like online direct retail platforms rather than physical showrooms. And uh, now the company has also gone on to say that they will be launching about 200 experience centers in the country uh, over the next uh, uh, few months, which is to give a look and feel of the scooter uh, in flesh and bud to the public. So there seems to be a change in the retail strategy of the company as well. Uh, so let's see what happens in the days to come. Now, SoftBank-backed uh, Oyo Hotels has revived its plans to check into Dalal Street. The company has filed fresh papers with market regulator SEBI. Oyo has also reported its maiden EBITDA positive quarter and losses have also narrowed. Yash Jain is here with the details. Well, the delay which came about as far as Oyo Hotels uh, IPO is concerned, that certainly created a lot of uncertainty amongst primary market investors. But there's something to cheer about now as far as Oyo Hotels is concerned. What we've been given to understand is that the company has filed an addendum along with its DRHP with market regulator SEBI. Now, what's an addendum? It's essentially an additional piece of information which needs to be uh, kept updated from time to time. And in the case of Oyo Hotels, it has been the updated financial performance for the company. What's sources tell us is that Oyo Hotels has submitted the Q1 FY23 results with market regulator SEBI, the financial performance for the first quarter. Also, the company that is Oyo Hotels uh, uh, looks at submitting the Q2 FY23 results with SEBI. That will be done by October. As far as uh, SEBI's approval for the IPO is concerned, Oyo Hotels that uh, to come in by about uh, December this year and eventually launch its IPO in the fourth quarter of FY23. As far as the financial performance for the company is concerned, it's a story about narrowing losses and rebound in sales post that COVID impact. So revenue from operations, that was up 21% in FY22. The losses also halved, came to about 1890 crore rupees. Uh, speaking purely about the first quarter the latest update which has been submitted with SEBI the Q1 FY23 EBITDA profit this is the maiden EBITDA profit made by the company of about 7 crore rupees also the net loss that has come down significantly in the first quarter to about 350 crore rupees all right thanks Yash uh, the documents also highlighted that founder and CEO Ritesh Agarwal's pay package stood at 5.6 crore rupees in the last fiscal year. That's an increase of 250% from the year before. And speaking of IPOs, German car manufacturer Volkswagen is expecting to raise over $9 billion from the initial public offering of its sport car brand, Porsche. The offer period is set to begin tomorrow with a planned trading start on September 29th. Volkswagen is eyeing a valuation of $75 billion in what is likely to be the largest IPO in Europe in more than a decade. Back home, the Comptroller and Auditor General has expressed concerns over the budgetary process followed by the Department of Economic Affairs. CAG has called for realistic estimates after the DEA allocated more than 60,000 crore rupees for FI21 but utilized only about 27,000 crore rupees. Tim C. Jepuria has the details. Well, as Finance Ministry will soon get into the budget preparation mode, there seems to be a caution that has been flagged by CAG. In its recent report in August, CAG has noted expressing concerns about the Department of Economic Affairs under the Finance Ministry on its own budgeting process for itself. CAG has asked DEA to be cautious in the upcoming budgets. These observations were made by CAG in its recent compliance audit report, pointing out that budgeting issues at DEA are of a concern. And CAG said in FY21, and I quote, savings at 33,975.03 crores, that is the difference between grant and spending, was substantial, reflecting poor budgeting in the department, end of quote. CAG has also flagged several examples, citing lapses 
lapses in budgeting by DEA in the past years too, highlighting the difference between the grants and the spending. A breakup of this is flashing on your screens. Important to note here that such observations have not been made alone by CAG. Even Parliamentary Standing Committee too has similar views. Earlier in March, Parliamentary Standing Committee stressed upon the need for quote-unquote realistic preparations of budget estimates and revised estimates and full utilization of allocated funds. And I quote here, the Department of Economic Affairs being the nodal department in formulation of budget is expected to observe the requisite financial norms and maintain fiscal prudence while making budgetary allocations and thus endeavor to be a role model for other ministries and departments in preparation of realistic estimates and optimum utilization of funds sanctioned, end of quote. Let's see how cautious is DEA in the upcoming budgets. Back to you. All right, thanks, Timsey, for joining us. Let's uh, move on and get you other business news. Shares of tea manufacturer McLeod Russell hit upper circuit for the second straight day. The Sox is uh, rallying on a possible takeover of the company by carbon resources. Lenders of McLeod Russell have uh, received a non-binding letter of intent from carbon resources to acquire controlling stake in the company. CNBC TV 18 has accessed this letter in which carbon resources is offered to infuse upfront equity worth 300 crore rupees and fresh debt worth over 900 crore rupees to repay debt to existing lenders. Canada-based fund Ontario Teachers Pension Plan will be picking up 30% stake in Mahindra Sustin, the Mahindra Group's renewable energy arm at an equity value of 2,371 crore rupees. The deal also entails setting up an infrastructure investment trust. The Mahindra Group and Ontario Teachers will jointly explore setting an additional 9.5%. 9% stake by the end of this fiscal. After Adani Group completed the acquisition, Ambuja Cements has sought shareholder approval for a 20,000 crore rupee cash infusion in its EGM on October 8th. The cement major will seek approval for allotment of nearly 40 H crore warrants at nearly 419 rupees to promote a group Harmonia Trade and Investment. The company will also seek approval for the appointment of Gautam Adani and others on the board. Speaking about the cement foray, Gautam Adani set a target of doubling the capacity in five years. We expect significant margin expansion to become the most profitable cement manufacturer in the country. And we anticipate going from the current 70 million tons capacity to 140 million tons in the next five years. All right, uh, the government continues to protect domestic tyre companies from cheaper imports. The Director General of Trade Remedies has recommended continuation of anti-dumping duty on import of new or unused radial tyres from China. The decision follows appeals made by MRF, Apollo Tyres and JK Tyre Industries. Time for a short break, but coming up, world leaders, including heads of state from US, France, Germany and others are in London to attend the funeral of Queen Elizabeth. Details when we are back. Welcome back. You're watching India Business Hour. Let's uh, get you a quick check of uh, the big story that we have been tracking. And this is from Hazari Bagh, a rather unfortunate incident. A 27-year-old pregnant woman, Monica Mehta, has died after she was allegedly run over by loan recovery agents working for Mahindra Finance. The incident took place in Jharkhand's Hazari Bagh. The woman was trying to stop the seizure of her father's tractor over loan dues. Mahindra Group has promised to investigate the matter and extend support to authorities. A group of protesters gather outside an M&M finance outlet in Hazaribagh. This after a pregnant woman was allegedly run over by loan recovery agents working for the company. Mithilesh Mehta is a farmer who is differently abled. He took a loan from Mahindra Finance to buy a tractor. According to Mehta, loan recovery agents tried to seize his tractor over dues. He claims he was ready to pay 1.2 lakh rupees and the total amount due was 1.3 lakh rupees. Mehta says when his 27-year-old daughter Monica Mehta tried to stop them and asked for seizure documents, she was mowed down. 
My tractor was parked beside my house. They said that they are confiscating the tractor and will release it once full payment is done. So then I asked for proof and seizure documents. They said, who are you to ask and ran over my daughter. Union Minister of State for Education, Annapurna Devi, met the victim's family at their residence and promised speedy justice. तुरंत इस पर सजा मिले ऐसे लोगों को फास्ट ट्रैक सुनवाई के माध्यम से ऐसे लोगों पर सुनवाई होनी चाहिए सजा अभी तो सबसे पहले कि तुरंत अभी चूंकि थाना प्रभारी यहाँ पे है एसपी से भी बात करेंगे कि जितना जल्द हो सके गिरफ्तारी हो जो भी दोषी है Responding to the incident, the MD and CEO of M&M Group, Anish Shah, said, and I quote, We will investigate this incident from all aspects and will also undertake an examination of the practice of using third-party collection agencies that have been in existence. We stand with the family in this moment of grief. End of quote. Anand Mahindra also tweeted saying, This is a terrible tragedy. Our hearts go out to the family in this time of grief. The police have registered a case of murder and a loan recovery agent, Roshan Singh, who was named by the victim's family, has been arrested. This way, the agents, the private the finance companies, the agents, I would like to give you the advice to you. If you have any kind of illegal means for your recovery, then whatever the law is made by the police, we will do it in a different way. Just last month, RBI tightened the rules for loan recovery agents while making it clear that the ultimate responsibility would have to be borne by the lenders. While there is no published data on the proportion of recovery efforts that are outsourced, industry experts say a majority of the NPA recovery in such cases is typically outsourced to agents by banks and NBFCs. With inputs from Javed Khan in Hazaribagh, CNBC TV 18 Bureau Report. Quick look at the other headlines. The Punjab government constitutes a three-member all-women investigation team to probe the leak of objectionable videos from Chandigarh's University Girls Hostel. Police has made three arrests so far, including a student. The university has suspended the hostel warden, Rajvinder Kaur, for alleged misbehavior with students. The university has also been shot for students till Saturday following protests by students. Samajwadi Party Chief Akhilesh Jadav and other leaders of the party marched to the state assembly from their party office to protest against the state government. However, they were stopped from entering the assembly due to lack of permission. The Enforcement Directorate has turned its lenses on another leader of the Ahmadni Party, Durgesh Patak. The ED has summoned Patak in the ongoing liquor policy probe. Patak is AAP's MLA from Delhi's Rajinder Nagar and also in charge for the Delhi Municipal Corporation elections. He becomes the fourth AAP leader to come under the ED scrutiny. A Delhi court says uh, trial court proceedings against former Delhi Health Minister Satyendra Jain in a money laundering case. The Enforcement Directorate has filed a plea urging that the case proceeding be transferred to another judge. The Supreme Court refers a Sio Moto plea on framing guidelines on mitigating circumstances to be considered before issuing a death penalty to a five-judge bench. The court says that the bench should decide authoritatively on when an accused can be given an opportunity to present mitigating circumstances before the death penalty is imposed. Queen Elizabeth's coffin has begun the final journey being taken from Westminster Abbey to Windsor Castle. The 96-year-old monarch will be laid to rest after 11 days of her death. She will be buried next to her late husband, Prince Philip. Leaders and royals from around the world are in London to bid goodbye to UK's longest-serving monarch. Sanjay Suri is now joining us with the latest. Sanjay, give us a sense of uh, what's happening there. We believe several world leaders have are now in London well, a lot of world leaders came and they were in Westminster Abbey uh, for the uh, funeral service. But of course, it was not just them. There are about uh, 2,000 people who were in Westminster Abbey, and that included uh, many people who are not, uh, eminently not, if you can call it that, uh, VIPs, uh, and people who worked with the Queen, whose work that she respected and honored. A lot of them were present as well, but it's again, not about those in Westminster Abbey. The whole country is focused on this funeral. The whole country has been in mourning. And she died on the 8th of September. And all these days, there was something to wait for, some new service 
some new ceremony. This was the last. And the last was both somber and spectacular. And put the two together, add in the very precise choreography uh, that uh, surrounded and that enabled this event. And it was quite a spectacular farewell to the Queen, one intended for people not to forget for a long time to come. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sanjay, for joining us with the latest on the Queen's funeral. Of course, uh, this is an important moment and uh, we have been seeing the outpouring of grief as well and the large number of people waiting in queues to pay their last respects. Moving on, Russia targets another nuclear plant in Ukraine, but reactors not damaged, according to reports. Ukraine's military claims to have repelled Russian attacks on Kherson and Kharkiv. Meanwhile, Russian pop star Ala Pugacheva speaks out against the war in Ukraine. U.S. President Joe Biden vowed to defend Taiwan against China in case of an unprecedented attack in an interview. The Chinese government said that Biden's statement violates the One China policy and an important commitment made by America to not support Taiwan's independence. We agree with what we signed on to a long time ago and that there's a One China policy and Taiwan makes their own judgments about their independence. We are not moving, we're not encouraging them being independent. We're not, let, that's their decision. But would U.S. forces defend the island? Yes, if in fact there was an unprecedented attack. Let's go across to Arundhati Ramnan now, who is standing by with all the headlines from the start of world. Arundhati, over to you. All right, thank you so much for that, Parikshit. Here's what's making news in the startup world. DotPay, a multi-channel commerce platform for big and medium-scale merchants, raises $58 million in a Series B funding round led by Temasek. The round saw participation from existing investors, PayU and InfoEdge Ventures. Mitsubishi and Naya Capital also joined as new investors. Meanwhile, Paytm tokenizes over 93% of the monthly active cards on its app. The company has tokenized 52.3 million cards across Visa, Masterpay, and Rup MasterCard and Rupee. It claimed to be on track to meet RBI's deadline to purge saved card data ahead of the RBI deadline. Now, a student from Jaipur has received a reward of 38 lakh rupees from Instagram for saving social media accounts of crores of people from being hacked. As per information, Neeraj Sharma found a bug in Instagram due to which thumbnails could be changed in any user's account without a login or a password. And from around the globe, Elon Musk tweets that Starlink is now active on all the continents, including Antarctica. Starlink is the satellite internet arm of Elon Musk's rocket enterprise SpaceX. It aims to provide internet access to remote areas of the world. Starlink satellites replace the internet services in Ukraine after the Russian invasion. With that, it is back to you. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, Arundhati, with all uh, the snapshots from the startup world. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business Hour. Thank you for watching. News continues right here on CNBC TV 18.